Welcome to Singing Out, where I look at musicals with queer female characters in them because there are like four musicals that'll cop to being about lesbians. Today we'll be discussing Peter Pan Live, the 2014 live production of Mary Martin's Peter Pan, put on by NBC, starring Allison Williams, Taylor Lauterman, and Christopher Walken doing an impression of Apocalypse Now era Marlon Brando. Now, for many reasons, Peter Pan Live is a lot to cover, and a straight synopsis isn't necessarily a good format for this review, so let's start with some background. To begin, I'm a little bit assuming anyone viewing this is already familiar with the story of Peter Pan, but just to be safe, here's a quick overview. Peter Pan, a boy who refuses to grow up, takes Wendy Darling, a young woman on the cusp of adolescence, I think, think I'm not sure how old Wendy is supposed to be, and her two younger brothers on an adventure to Neverland, so that Wendy can act as a mother to the Lost Boys, Peter's crew of young boys who have fallen out of their strollers. There they contend with Captain Hook, the villainous pirate who wants revenge on Peter for feeding Hook's hand to a crocodile. The crocodile lurks around Hook, trying to finish his meal, and also ticks because he swallowed a clock. Eventually, Wendy decides to return home with not only her brothers, but all of the lost boys aside from Peter. While they attempt to leave, they get kidnapped by Captain Hook, and Peter has to rescue them all. Also of note, Tinkerbell, the fairy who allows them all to fly by sprinkling them with fairy dust, and Tiger Lily and her tribe of non-specific natives that proves racism is neither gone nor America-specific. So, Peter Pan is an iconic character in children's literature, and a familiar one. There are approximately 20 stage adaptations that I could find of this story, including one with lyrics by Leonard Bernstein starring Boris Karloff and one of Mary Martin's rumored lovers that premiered a mere four years before this one, as well as several film adaptations, half a dozen TV shows, video games, and a bunch of novels. And this isn't even the only filmed version of this adaptation. Mary Martin and the original Broadway cast performed it three times for NBC, including a version that was recorded and aired annually for a while, and Kathy Rigby starred in a 2000 production for A&E based on the 1998 Broadway revival. As you might have noticed, Peter Pan has traditionally been played by a woman, a tradition going back to the original 1904 play. This is because, at the time, English law prohibited children under the age of 14 to appear on stage after 9 p.m. So if Peter is played by a woman, it eliminates concerns about him appearing too grown up by being played by an adult male, or having to worry about a teenager's voice breaking. It wasn't until 2003 that a live-action Peter Pan was played by a male actor in the original story. 1991's Hook has Robin Williams playing Peter Pan, but it's set well after the events of Barry's play, with an adult Peter regaining his childhood spirit, and Disney's Peter Pan does have a male voice actor playing Peter, but it's a cartoon. Peter Pan Live keeps this tradition going, while sidestepping the traditional double cast of Hook and Mr. Darling, with Christian Borel, who's Mr. Darling, instead playing Hook's second-in-command, Mr. Schmee. So, how does Peter Pan Live measure up? Honestly, looking at this show, it seemed right to divide my thoughts into three categories. The good, the bad, and the gay. We'll start with the ringers. Kelly O'Hara and Minnie Driver are both fun to watch in anything. Their short parts make me wish they were more of both, minus Minnie Driver's narration, but that's not her fault. Christian Borel is clearly familiar with the Peter Pan mythos. He played Captain Hook on Broadway in Peter and the Starcatchers, which is a prequel to Peter Pan, and does a good job embodying Smee's sycophantic glee. Give him a silent tickle with Jane or Johnny Corkscrew. In fact, all of the pirates who are not Christopher Walken are fun and seem to be having a good time themselves. <sighs> I like explosions. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Me too, giant pirate gentlemen. Me too. Meanwhile, Allison Williams and Taylor Lauterman as Peter and Wendy have fantastic chemistry. They 
create an interesting dynamic of not understanding each other despite genuine mutual affection and the misunderstanding seems reasonable instead of bad rom com which can be pretty difficult to do even with Peter Pan. Ready to attack, so keep up your guard. I only see beauty. And Alison Williams can really sing and has a surprisingly good sense of acting a song for someone who got her big break doing the mumblecore inspired girls. Her solo When I Went Home is pretty heartbreaking and probably one of the best parts of the show. I thought that certainly someone would leave the door a window open wide for me. Once Upon a Time and Long Ago is sweet enough to distract me from Taylor Louderman's terrible English accent. And it brings Kelly O'Hara back, which automatically endears it to me. Also, it's always nice when shows acknowledge that the darling parents are missing their children, and it's not something that every adaptation does. Finally, and most importantly for reviving Peter Pan in 2014, they brought in Chickasaw composer and pianist Jared Impichichawa Tate to help rewrite the music and lyrics to the song Ugawug, which they thankfully renamed True Blood Brothers, and cast Alana Saunders, a descendant of the Cherokee Nation, as Tiger Lily. Unlike some other contemporary Peter Pan adaptations I could name. <clears throat> Rooney Mara. And this is a longer section, because honestly, there's a lot wrong with this musical. It's just not working. For one thing, I wasn't kidding at the beginning, Christopher Walken really is demonstrating late-stage Brando levels of not giving a single fuck. We know he can sing and dance, like, look at Weapon of Choice, and it's so frustrating because his performance in this is so terrible that it almost retroactively makes his parts in Hairspray and other things worse. Like, I'm not 100% sure that Christopher Walken wasn't actually asleep during large portions of this production. Also, I think the pink parasol might actually be undermining Hook's foppishness. What fop would wear that much red and then have a pink parasol? They clash. Less severely a problem, but still there, is that I think Alison Williams was miscast. Now, I don't think she's a bad actress by any means, and her singing is really good, but Honestly, who looks at this face and goes, yes, boy, I buy that. Like, butch, sure, but there's not an androgynous bone in her body. And she doesn't really seem to understand the style necessary to make the show work. Then we are both doomed, it's true. Her acting is too naturalistic, I guess, and too adult for the kind of nonsense they have her say. Like, now come inside with the boys! Tiger Lily and Wendy fighting over Peter is canonical, but it's weird how completely aware of what's going on Allison Williams as Peter looks. Also, the accent is distracting. Other Peters played by Americans have American accents. It's not a deal breaker. Say, that's it. And Williams and Walken together are also bad. The song where Peter and Hook meet for the first time. For one thing, Allison Williams and Christopher Walken haven't rehearsed it as well as they should have. Like, they're supposed to be singing in sync, but instead they're singing over each other. Good day to you, Hook. Good day to you, Pan. What a pleasure, pleasure to, to meet, meet you, you again. again. For another, it happens more than an hour into a just over two hour musical, which is too long. In fact, this whole show was too long. I can remember maybe three songs at any given time from it and none of them particularly well. There are four songs before we even see Neverland, three in a row from Peter talking about how awesome he and his life are. Then there are three songs from the Pirates before Peter and Wendy even get to Neverland, and none of them really seem to move the plot forward. It seems like you could cut two or three songs before we reach the half hour mark. Plus this show is half an hour longer than the 1960 and 2000 versions, both of which seem to drag a little bit anyway. It's just, there's too much there. 
especially when things like the flying choreo choreography take up so much time. On the way to Neverland, there's not really enough space to make the flying engaging, but there's still a whole song worth of it. Later in the show, when there is enough room, it looks like it's beyond Alice and William's abilities, which is fair, I guess, but it's really hard to get through entire songs where flying is supposed to be the centerpiece, and it's lame. Like, even comparing this to Mary Martin's performance in the 60s, it's really lame. And then there's the really bizarre costume choices that they made. Like, the crocodile. Look, I understand you can't have a real crocodile on stage the way you can have a real dog, but this weird Technicolor rainbow fish design does not work. It makes it distractingly obvious that there's a human in there, and it's also not at all intimidating or interesting. It's bizarre. Who designed this? Why? Speaking of why costuming, Tiger Lily and her tribe's costumes are pretty terrible. Tiger Lily looks like a porn parody, but I'm not sure of what, because it's not a porn parody of Peter Pan. And her tribe not only is all male, which is weird, but they look like they went to the Lost Boy auditions and grabbed every dude of color and then shoved them into loincloths and flesh-toned hot pants. J.M. Berry supposedly based Tiger Lily and company on tribes from the northeastern United States, and Gerard Tate was specifically inspired by the Iroquois. So why didn't the costume designer lean into that? Also, hashtag save Tinkerbell is lame. It's just lame. To start with, the decision to make the Lost Boys grown men kind of undermines the whole point of casting a woman as Peter. When surrounded by 12 to 17 year old boys, a grown woman can appear close enough to a big kid to go along with. When surrounded by grown male dancers dressed like British schoolboys, Alison Williams looks like a butch trying to prove that she's one of the guys. Plus, Alison Williams doesn't look androgynous. And she doesn't act like a child. She acts like Maria von Trapp. Probably trembling in terror on the Dolly Roger. <laughs> Plus, the grown men dress like British schoolboys, especially when dance fighting with the tribesmen in the flesh-toned hot pants and loincloths look like they're in some kind of bizarre fetish wear. So there's not really any image of them that doesn't look like either a pride float or the beginning of a gay porn. Especially with Tiger Lily's tribe next to them. It looks like twinks and studs pairing off. And as a result of this, the pirates, who are always camp, become even more so. Plus, a bunch of the shots of the Jolly Roger kind of make it look like a parade float, which doesn't help. Meanwhile, Peter's costume looks like someone stole it from my friend's closet. Specifically, it looks like something her girlfriend would make her wear at Pride. Mary Martin's costume from 1960 definitely influenced lesbian aesthetic, but it wasn't something I'd expect to see outside of a costume party. Allison Williams' costume requires jeans to make it lesbian streetwear. Also, it's got a mesh undershirt for some reason, and anything mesh makes something 25% gayer. It's, it's a rule. Also, I don't know who designed Taylor Louderman's wig, but I'm wondering why they stole it from season one of Xena Warrior Princess. Speaking of Taylor Louderman, her new song, and there were several new songs, which is weird since everything else is so lazy, only, but her song, Only Pretend, is the most explicit description of Wendy's attraction to Peter I can recall seeing in a mainstream adaptation. You're like no boy I know Oh, what clue did I miss Is a kiss like a kiss Why does it reveal And while, to be honest, I don't know if I'd contextualize this as necessarily gayer in another production, in this one, when you've already got a lot of 
other things added to it, it's a really odd choice to make that relationship more explicitly romantic. Peter will be your father. I'm sorry, but every time Wendy calls Peter father, all I can think of is an old white dude hearing a woman call another woman the period equivalent of daddy. I feel like that gets a very different reaction in 1904 than it does a hundred plus years later. It's a lot harder to look at something in 2014 that could seem gay and conclusively call it straight than it was in 1904 or even 1954. So when you've already got a character that's a queer icon, it's odd to make the choices NBC has made when they're clearly not actually trying to lean into it. And that's part of the reason that I can't help but feel like this production was a mistake. I don't think whoever chose this at NBC understood the property they were reviving or the audience they were going to get with it. They're clearly trying to lean into nostalgia and hate watching with their live musicals, especially for the first few. And so while there's no way they were going to court a clear audience, I think that could have been a smarter business decision. While it's hard to take something that's never going to have canonically queer characters and make it queerer in 2014 when queer audiences are looking for explicit representation, it seems easier than finding hate watchers for this show. Ultimately, that's what they were looking for, and I think that was a fundamental misunderstanding of either the source material or hate watching as a concept. Peter Pan is too one important for proper hate watching. The original is beloved, I guess, but it's generally an indulgent rather than a protective love. No one was going to claim this version ruined the old one, and the cheesy production values in camp that I think was meant to engender that feeling don't work when the original looked like this. And so, before the blinking of an eye, those boys will eat that poison cake, and one by one, they'll die today. So because most of the creative choices seem to be rooted in attempts to make people mad from casting Allison Williams to the design of the crocodile, there's no conviction here, only people doing their best with what they were given, and that's a frustrating watch, but not a particularly engaging one. Part of the reason this video is late is that I could only watch 15 to 20 minutes of this at a time before being distracted, because it's such a slog. So my non-professional opinion is, don't watch this. If you want to get angry at a live musical, watch Carrie Underwood try to act in The Sound of Music live. If you want to see Peter Pan, check out Mary Martin or Kathy Rigby. If you're here for Allison Williams, watch College Musical, or just look at this picture. Anything you imagine looking at this picture will be significantly more interesting than Peter Pan Live. I'll be over here, hoping she gets cast in another live musical soon, though. Hell, bring La Taylor Louderman back, too, and do, I don't know, Calamity Jane Live. So that's it for Peter Pan Live, thank God. Next time we'll be discussing an entirely different Allison and a very different musical. Daddy, hey daddy, come here, okay? I need you.